Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this session uh, supported by Mindre that we thanks. We are happy. I'm uh, Professor Sami Jaber from Montpellier, France, and it's my pleasure to co-moderate uh, this uh, session with uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Daniel Telmer from uh, Boston. And uh, this uh, session will be very interesting and attractive around the topic of the patient safety alarms and uh, all the data in uh, the critical care patient in ICU. We have uh, three expert uh, speaker, and uh, I will let uh, my colleague Danny to uh, introduce first uh, speaker. Danny, thank you. Thank, thank you, Samir. So our first speaker today is um, Dr. Fiona Niu, an anesthesiologist from China who serves as the Global Marketing Director for MindRay. And Dr. New will be talking about alarms in and out of the ICU. Dr. New. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Fiona Niu. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist. Now I'm working in Murray as a global marketing director. So it's my honor to be here to present alarm management in and out of ICU. Uh, so why we mentioned about alarm management, I think is a really important thing is we find uh, in 2014, the top 10 health technology hazard, the top one is alarm. So we should pay more attention about that. So this is why we need to work on the alarm management in and out of ICU. But first of all, we wanted to go through the survey study in ICU. So uh, this study actually to interview the nurse and the patients. So what kind of a device or what kind of uh, patient monitor do you want to have? So we, I just uh, highlight uh, some uh, information. It's about how they wanted to, if even the patient stayed in ICU, could we have some wireless cable to let patient can move more you know, uh, comfortable? Another is uh, we should have more information from alarm management, how to let nurse and the doctors manage patient more efficiency. The second star we will say is like a random control trial. So we will say if the patient didn't stay in ICU, in the general world, it's necessary to use the vital sign monitor patient so we will say this is uh, roughly about the uh, patient and the nurse physician's interview. So we will see, actually, even in general world, we still want to continue monitoring patient situation so that we can get the more earlier uh, warning score to let the nurse and the physician manage patient. So the second is we still need some you know, uh, uh, general word use the vital signs to light the patient's uh, situation more safe. So this is uh, for general word about the continual patient monitor. So if we want to continue monitor patient safety in and out of ICU, so what kind of device or what kind of software do we need? So we said, actually, during the alarm management, it's not only single alarm or not only single status. It's a kind of like alarm chain. So first of all, we need to process, process uh, alarm, and uh, we can finalize the patient situation, and uh, we need some software, kind of like uh, alarm guard, to monitor patient's alarm and then we can distribute a different level to different physicians. 
So the first thing we want to say, if we want precise alarm, how to do it? It means we need to reduce the false alarm. We use some technology to combine the different alarm to analyze what is really important alarm to us. And then second, we need highlighted alarm to the doctors, to the nurse, so that when they get the alarm, they know how to deal with the patient, how to treat the patient. So this is a study uh, in China. We can say we combined five hospitals, more than uh, 1,000 cases. So this is a different center. We can say use the precise alarm. Actually, this technology definitely reduce the false alarm. This is really a good effort for us. And uh, another is if we have precise alarm, but still a lot of how to analyze alarm. So this is another hospital in China, in general ICU. We can say there are uh, 12, uh, 24 beds, and uh, we collect uh, one month alarm data. So we can say there are a huge alarm, is uh, more than 200,000. So from alarm type distribution, we can say half half from technology, half half from uh, ph physiology. So, but if we really to device alarm, we will say most is lower medial alarm, but really important high priority alarm only seven percentage. So how to use the seven percentage alarm to let doctor nurse to treat the patient or get uh, our high priority to check the patient. I think this is really important. How to reduce lower and the medial alarm. So this is another case. It's uh, in hospital. So I just want to, I want uh, information more details. So the red bar is from patient monitor. We can say respiratory rate is really quite high. There are a lot of alarm from that. But when you say green one, it's a heart rate high from ventilator is quite lower. So what happened? So one patient from different device, we got different alarm pieces. So what happened? So actually, when we see the upper alarm, we can say from patient monitor, actually nurse set up alarm threshold at 30. They didn't change it. But from a ventilator, actually in this hospital, they have a strong RT team. So they can manage the patient very well. They can set up individual alarm for the each patient. So this is why we can get the very different alarm from different device. So we think if we, can, we got this information, how to set up each device, alarm, three holes, I think this is really important. We should think about that. Uh, the, another uh, study we can say, we analyzed one month for the uh, ICU patient. We can say there are different beds, actually the alarm is different. Some uh, bed is really higher, some is lower. Also, we checked uh, different time in 24 hours. Actually, we have some time, the alarm is really, lo lo is really high, but some is really lower. So how to think about that? How to analyze this alarm? So I want to uh, talk about more detail, but we should think about maybe in, I think now one nurse manages two beds, right, is generally. But should we think about use this data to improve nurse workload? Actually, we can do better. So 
Let me summarize uh, the alarm you know, uh, management. I think so we still get different type of alarm from different uh, device, but we still have time or still have some room to organize the three holes setting up individual parameters for each patient. Also, we need inference uh, to reduce false alarm to each patient. Okay, so we know this is really important alarm management in ICU, but if we think about, do, I, do we need manage the patient's vital sign out of ICU, or just uh, reduce patients go to ICU? So this is a study about uh, uh, patient outcome if we use the continue vital sign. So we can see, if we use the continual uh, vital sign, uh, the patient transfer to ICU will reduce. Another is if we have RRT team, actually their workload, you can reduce the two. So this is we think about how to manage the patient out of ICU, probably in hospital in general world. So the, another study, actually is from financial side. We can see if we use continual vital sign or some continual device, wearable device, from financial side, we can see the hospital can see much money. And another is actually, if you buy more continual or wearable device or, or vital sign, actually is really good investment. So this is another during COVID study uh, because we go through that is like uh, many patients, but uh, we don't many ICU beds. So this study just show if you carry on the uh, wearable or continue monitor to let patient go home, actually they don't need, most of them don't need go to ICU. Actually, this is another study to show if even the patient stayed at home, we still need some device to monitor them. So we talk about the alarm management, definitely the important is about status alarm. Why? Because the alarm is allowed from different devices. There are a lot of parameters how to combine the alarm to let doctor nurse know what exactly happened to the patient, what exactly happened to some system, organs. So actually, if we combine different parameters, we can lay out some function to about the patient lung or cardio or some infection. So this is why we need come by alarm to let the doctor and the nurse know uh, what exactly happened. So if we talk about the alarm, definitely we don't want to send each alarm to all clinicians, to nurse, to doctor, to director, or to the you know, uh, chief guard. So we will separate different live alarm to different physicians. For nurse, for doctor, they focus on different patients' situation, right? So we can do it. And uh, another, the last thing is about wearable device. I know now many, many uh, industry work on that. So we will lay out a different type of wear, uh, wearable device to the different uh, levels, hospital and to different uh, uh, situation. For example, if in patient in the hospital, in general world, actually we can carry on that, just transfer patient to hospital central station. But if patient go back home, how to manage this information for doctors or nurse in hospital? So we can use the wearable device and the patient can use the your phone, there are one apps 
you can upload the data to the hospital so that the hospital can manage the data. If something happens, they can call the patient or they can call family. So I think this is another way to protect patient safety. So this is uh, my last uh, uh, slide. I just wanted to summarize uh, alarm management in and out of, out of ICU. I think we still need to pay more attention about mute alarm, false alarm. And another is precise alarm, I think, more important. This is technology definitely from the industry. Another is we have a huge alarm and data in ICU. How to analyze to improve patient safety definitely from our clinicians, our doctors, nurses. And another is if patient need to go home, we still need some wearable patient monitor to manage patient to improve patient safety. So um, thank you everyone to uh, listen to uh, my lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. New, for your very nice presentation. It's very clear with uh, your main messages. The uh, presentation is uh, open to discussion. If you have uh, any question, any comments uh, in the audience, please. Maybe one question, uh, Dr. New, about uh, the experience in the world. Could you say this, just one word about the different experiences uh, of the management of the alarms outside ICU in the different part in the world? Do you have some data? What's the difference between, I don't know, in the, for example, in US, in North America, in Boston, I don't know, in um, Italy, in uh, Montpellier, in France, in Paris, and other in Asia, etc. Do you have some great difference that we have for the management about the culture or something like this? Okay, thank you, Professor Jiver. I think this is a really good question. So when we think about uh, improve the uh, uh, wearable device out of ICU, I think this important is we realize when I try with many countries in different regions, we see the different situation. So I live in China, so I know in China actually <coughs> Uh, before that, we don't need more uh, vital sun to monitor patient out of uh, ICU in general world. But now more and more uh, patients want to, you know, more, we want to improve patient safety. So in China, actually, they don't use vital sun. They use the uh, compact uh, patient monitor in general world in, in uh, emergency. But when I try to uh, Europe, I can see more, many countries actually focus on the how to manage patients out of ICU in general world. They use the vital sign, but uh, we should think of how to continue to monitor patients. This way, we, we should think if we just, uh, you know, each two hours, three hours to measure patients' vital sign, I think it's not enough. So this is why we, uh, you uh, innovate some wearable device. You patient can carry on. You can walk any place, but we just make sure a patient is safe. Can I can I ask a question? So yeah. you showed very nice data how the re the respiratory alarm from the monitor was very different from yeah. the ventilator, and probably very wrong. So do you foresee that we will have an Internet of Things in the ICU where all the devices talk to each other? and then we get um, an integrated picture of the alarms rather than looking at the monitor for one set and the pump for another and the ventilator for a third set. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tomar. I think uh, uh, this is why I, I mentioned we need to come by alarm. So if we uh, got the alarm from individual device, we need to uh, think about, okay, what happened to the patient? What maybe, we, first of all, we should think, oh, the, this device is not good enough. But uh, if we combine different device alarm together, we can analyze, okay, 
what really happened to the patient. Is the patient really respiratory right is really high or we need to think about maybe we set up the parameter it's not it's not good enough. We should adjust. So this is why uh, we when we got the information we analyze. So what happened? Or oh, maybe patient monitor, you know, is something wrong or the ventilator is something wrong. But when I analyze that, I, we talk to nurse, you should set up, you should change alarm, threshold, lead be higher, because you know, the patient uses the mechanical ventilation. So definitely we cannot set up that uh, alarm to be 30. So when they change it, actually they reduce the, a lot of false alarm. So I think uh, we need to think about how to combine more and more parameters to analyze that. And then actually, I definitely think we will reduce nurse workload. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Niu. Uh, I propose you to follow to the next speaker. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce my colleague and my best friend, Professor Elia Zoulet from Paris, France. Eli is the head of department of uh, Saint Louis Intensive Care Unit uh, in Paris. And as you know, Eli is uh, our president of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Eli will try to convince us that uh, a good monitoring of alarm and optimization of the monitoring alarm could probably improve outcome in ICU. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much, Samia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm the president-elect of the European Society, and it's my pleasure to go more into the personal experience of alarms in the ICU. So these are my disclosures, and I would like to thank Mindry and for, for making this symposium happen, because we are dealing with a daily experience we know, and that's obvious, uh, that it would be very difficult to have critically ill patients uh, with no monitoring. We know that uh, we need to assess treatment response, but we need also to really be very careful at the physiological monitoring because we can detect uh, early organ dysfunction. We can also restore when we have treated the patients, uh, and we can also guide uh, uh, the, the, the following uh, management. On one hand, if we were disconnecting patients from any monitoring, which some case, in some case may happen for patients who are very isolated because of any infectious disease, and this paper came out before the COVID-19 experience, uh, and they just measured in the ICU the difference of outcomes between patients who were isolated for any respiratory or multidrug resistant bacteria uh, reason, and those patients were compared to other patients. Um, the, the, the very interesting thing is to measure the impact of isolation in terms of safety. When a patient is locked in a room with a very limited number of nurses and doctors coming in to check, to evaluate, to provide a clinical examination, is it so safe uh, and are there any, any uh, uh, side effects uh, for that? And uh, the interesting thing is that after adjusting for confounders, there were an increased number of uh, uh, undesirable side effects uh, and uh, medical errors that happened in those patients who were isolated. The safety of making a patient isolated in the ICU is now very clearly mentioned. So we need to find a balance between keeping the patients in the safe way and another problem that is the alarm fatigue. Alarms are producing a certain number of burden for everyone in the ICU, for patients, for family members, and for healthcare providers. This concept of alarm fatigue uh, is really a cacophony of sounds, and you know all of them. If you close your eyes, you can repeat on your mind 
every pump, every ventilator, every monitor alarm, every renal replacement therapy or anything that would provide a noise, and this noise creates an alarm fatigue. It's not something that is uh, uh, burdening at the time it is making noise. It is something that is burdening over time, and it adds to many other sources of burden, created discomfort for patients, creating harm for family members, and creating a large burden for healthcare providers. The other problem, and we are getting to the other extreme of uh, uh, this uh, alarm fatigue, is that uh, you have so much alarm that you, alarms that you are missing the right one. And inside everything, the alarm that is going to uh, uh, make uh, uh, something to alert you that something is happening is going to be missed in all other alarms. Let's look at the level of noise. And as you know, zero is the level, the threshold for audition for normal people. And the central air conditioning is 50 decibels. So you can see that a telephone ring is 70, that a ventilator alarm is 70, that a staff conversation at the bedside is 72, that a monitor alarm is 78, uh, and then you can see that a nebulizer is 80, perfusor alarm is 81, and a nursing station is 84. We live in a very noisy environment, and this has its own toxicity. It affects everyone in the ICU, patients, healthcare providers, and family members, but it's also something that makes that uh, nurses, for example, are going to have so much burden that it can ca create moral distress, burnout, and the intent to leave the ICU. Let's look at uh, comparative uh, uh, noise data with, uh, again, decibels. Um, and you can see that zero is, again, the threshold for human hearing. Um, a quiet forest is 20, a whisper is 30, an average conversation not the one we have now, is 50. But then you can see that uh, there are sources of noises, of noise that are uncontrollable in the ICU and are sometimes mandatory, but still create some burden. So there are many data, including information that goes to the lay public, making that this noise in the ICU has a toxicity that we can call alarm fatigue. So this is where we are. We are into a system where too many alarms not only cause burden, but also make you missing the, the important one, and too little monitoring affects patient safety. So where is the balance, uh, and how can we assess uh, the uh, global vision on, uh, on all of this? Uh, so for the patients, uh, there are many studies, qualitative ones, providing worry, annoyance, uh, and concerns about care quality from the alarms when you know, sometimes there is a very simple alarm uh, based on something that is expected, uh, and the nurse knows that she has to go to the other room, where for us in Europe, we have often not one nurse to one patient. So we, we then have an alarm that is going to maintain. So people in the room, patients and family members mostly, are concerned about uh, the quality of care when no one comes to control the alarm. For family members, it's a source of worry of delirium of family members that is very much undermined, of stress, of sleep deprivation, because when they are at home, they still listen and hear the alarms, and questions about safety. All of this noise is created by the ICU, the number of alarm devices, the non-actionable alarms at many places in the ICU, the volumes that could be controlled. And even for the nurses, it creates stress. It is decreasing sensitivity. You have so much alarm that when there is one that is very important, you're going to miss it. Dissatisfaction and also safety. I'm mostly referring on psychological safety. There are a lot of studies that have not only assessed the noise toxicity in the ICU, but also made some correlation with uh, uh, individual outcomes at a patient, a nurse, or a family uh, level. So this is a, a very funny study where the number, and there, the, the, this study published in PLUS One has been very much communicated because they have taken all monitor data for a certain number of patients, measuring um, 
arrhythmia for more than 12,000 patients uh, and calculating all of this in a one month period. So then you end up with about 400,000 audible alarms, uh, which is 100, 187 per bed and per day. So when you get to this and you want to understand alarm fatigue, uh, you can also understand that almost 90% of these alarms are false alarms, alarms that should not be there, alarms that we could control or maybe assess or maybe adjust or maybe only make that they are not there anymore. And this creates uh, a lot uh, of uh, uh, um, false information. Uh, we know that 93% uh, of the true TVs uh, were not sustained long enough to run treatment. Uh, and so we have plenty of noise, uh, and these excessive alarms create uh, the alarm fatigue. We know that not only we could control them by making appropriate settings, uh, we know that there are plenty of uh, rhythms that should not be uh, uh, an information, that there are non-actionable events, and that some sometimes it's about the amplitude of the complexes, of the curious complexes that could be uh, made, or sometimes uh, BB blocks making that we should be uh, aware of that and we should uh, adjust uh, the monitor according to that, and sometimes it's about uh, a VP rhythm. So this alarm fatigue is really a source of burden, making that when we go to qualitative interviews, mostly to the staff, we can see that it has a real burden in terms of fatigue, of moral distress, of burnout, and it's one of the reasons sometimes people are so tired that are starting to think on another way to live their life and leave the ICU. Overall, we know that uh, this alarm desensitization, making that we are giving little attention overall to alarms, missing some of the important information, makes that uh, we are also harming uh, sometimes and reducing patient safety. There are competing priorities in an ICU for many nurses. There are no escalation plan. When an alarm is there, we need to have a certain action. Sometimes the ICU is so big that we cannot get to the alarm. Sometimes we don't know exactly what is the alarm and one is under the other one. And sometimes in, in a given ICU, the responsibility for alarm in, are not so clear. We know also that the actionable limits have to be uh, uh, thought at a unit level. And uh, we note also that many alarms are duplicated. So all of this makes that we are reducing patient safety by creating alarm fatigue and alarm desensitization. This is a systematic review on the impact of alarm fatigue. And again, the burden of alarm has been really put forward in this study. And the burden is always seen by the nurses as something that is not justified and is just adding to other sources of burden in the ICU. Interestingly, you can really have a measurement of that. You can assess how much you can rank the priorities and you can rank the toxicity of these alarms. And there are many papers that are coming up to show how much we need to have an action on that. So I'm not getting into any solution. I'm just providing the, the evidence that the toxicity of alarm for everyone at stake in an ICU makes that uh, these data are reproduced and reproduced. Uh, and until recently with the COVID-19 experience, uh, we had so much on that uh, that uh, people need to find a solution. One of the solution would be to apply artificial, uh, artifi art artificial intelligence into that. And there are many programs that are now active, uh, some of them being pilots, some of them being already elaborated and validated, and some of them being used on a daily basis at some places. There are very little evidence that this translates into improvement at a patient, family, or healthcare provider level, because we are at the start of this, uh, but we know that there are ways uh, to really reduce alarm fatigue and reduce the toxicity of alarms, and we look forward to a literature that would then assess uh, the impact on this on people outcome in the, in the, people's outcome in the ICU. So to sum up, 
The physiological response to critical illness is strongly linked to outcomes, so we need to monitor and to have an early detection of treatment response. Uh, we know that uh, alarm fatigue really add to uh, reduce safety uh, in the ICU, and we can't accept that. Uh, we also know that alarm fatigue affects patients, family members, healthcare workers. Uh, it is real. There is a lot of evidence uh, either from a quantitative or qualitative analysis, uh, and we have identified the, the consequences of that. Uh, now we are at the starting period where solutions start to appear, and we look forward to proper evaluation of these solutions on all the burden that I have been describing during my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you. Are there questions from the audience um, for Dr. Azulai? May I open some questions? I, I think we have a question oh, here. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, please. My name is Markus. I'm from Germany. And let me have a question to the <coughs> poll session now. Um, Let me ask a little provocant question at this side. Um, who had published all these alarms we get on the ICU? <coughs> who was it? And as a user, I can't switch off alarms. For example, technical alarms. I can't turn them off. They, they, I can quit them, but they come at the next time again. Why can't I do this as a user, for example? So I could reduce noise just by myself, not with a large study or something like else, just by myself. But if you were working in my ICU, you would be killed by the nurses if you reduced your alarm by yourself. We work as a team, so we need to implement strategies that affect the entire system, from understanding what's the problem, to getting to controlling the alarm, and then finding a solution. If you, kick up, if you take off the alarm for yourself, so then you are harming the patients. There are data on that. There are data on how much we can extract patients from a monitoring and get to affect either medical errors, there are data, self-extubation, there are data, and there are even data on delirium. So the solution would not to find something that would fit to your own uh, wish. You need to find something that has to be discussed at a unit level with the nurses and with the entire team so that everyone will have an understanding of the same alarms. For example, in your ICU and is mine, we don't behave the same way when controlling alarms. And it's not a problem that for some alarms for which nurses are mastering the problem, it <coughs> takes maybe two or three minutes to control the alarm. The problem then is at a patient level and at a family level because they are questioning about how much safe is your ICU. On the other way, if you are not adjusting the alarm at a unit level, you are not controlling, you are not controlling alarm fatigue. You are maybe controlling your fatigue, but you are only one member of the ICU. You are not the ICU. Could you be the boss? So we need to find a systemic approach for that. There is only one way to do this uh, simply is to get together in the team and adjust the alarms based on some wishes <coughs> adapted to the patients. There are now other ways that are more intelligent and provide a control of these alarms based on prefix parameters. The validation is fine, but the translation of this into reducing the toxicity and alarm fatigue is not yet available, and we look forward to these studies. But in, in my ICU, for example, the nurse looks for, the, for the, uh, the space, when is there alarm coming and when not, and they do it on their own. And for most time, it's very good. So, for example, <laughs> they could be allowed to switch off some technical alarms when they know now they're washing the patient. There, mustn't, there must not be an alarm for heart rate, for example. I don't know how it is in your ICU, but in my ICU, even things on which nurses are not allowed to do, they do it because they need to survive. You need to survive to alarms. And sometimes you have two patients, but there are alarms in the two rooms. So someone has, but there is an alarm elsewhere. The problem is not the amount. 
for at a patient level, the problem is there are so many alarms for one patient that sometimes you miss the appropriate one <coughs> that would harm the patient. So for this to happen, I don't think that there's a local protocol that would bring back safety to the patient. We need to get beyond that uh, and we look forward to data. But for now, there are no data that are showing that we can increase patient safety by using AI for the patients. We are not having any data showing that AI also reduces burden at a patient family or healthcare provider level. We look for this data because we are at a starting point. I'm sure the data will come. I think we should do both. Look behind and look on special ICUs, how to adapt it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, discussion. I propose you to, uh, su yes. then if you are okay, we switch to the next. And again, thank you thank, for Eli for the presentation. Thank you, um, Professor Azulai. So our, our next speaker is um, Professor Paolo Navalisi from uh, the University of Padua in Italy. And Paolo will be speaking about the use of 24-hour data analysis in the ICU. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, uh, Mindre, for the kind invitation. And uh, I have to admit, uh, when I received this title, I got <laughs> kind of scared. And, and what you usually do, you go to PubMed and try to find literature, and I couldn't. So. Uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest. And uh, what uh, I actually did, uh, I went back to a concept uh, which was expressed more than 30 years ago by Martin Tobin in JAMA. And uh, he described, he summarized the major aims or goals of monitoring. And please note that alerting of significant changes in patients' condition. One, providing institution of life-saving measures. Two, aid with diagnosis and therapy. Three, and assessing therapeutic response and eventually predicting prognosis. Now, I tried and will present you a few case reports from my institution and uh, I will try to convince you that uh, beyond monitoring that we in general consider as something that is related to a specific event in the immediate timing in which it occurs, there is a role also for 24 hours, and if you want, 48 hours data analysis. Uh, let me start from a well-known consideration. This is a, a cohort study published in the Blue Journal a few years ago, uh, where the authors showed a high rate of arrhythmias in patients with uh, sepsis and an even higher rate of arrhythmia in patients with septic shock. And this was related independently on mortality and on prolonged length of stay in the ICU. Now, this is my first uh, case. He was a 60 year, 66 years old patient. He presented to the emergency room with a status epilepticus with no previous history of epilepsy. And he was intubated immediately in the emergency room, underwent a contrast CT of the head that showed a right parietal temporal mass. The patient started a therapy with levetiracetam. I'm sorry, I usually use the commercial name of the drug. And 
he was sedated and paralyzed, and then we started to re reduce a sedative IV drug. And uh, we observed during the day repeated episodes of a paroxysmal supraventricle tachycardia, which increased after ICU admission. And here, in the lower part of the slide, you have a summary of what happened in uh, the 24 hour. And so we had uh, different episodes and we had a broad range of heart rate that was related to these episodes. But let's look at the shape, at the description of the 24 hours heart rate report. Uh, you see in the first uh, row, day one, where we observed uh, three episodes of uh, paroxysmal supraventricle tachycardia that were treated with adenosine. And uh, after the second episode, we started the continuous infusion of beta blockers. Now, on day two, we actually found only a very brief episode, and we were very happy. Uh, we also treated that episode with adenosine, but we decided uh, to liberate the patient from mechanical ventilation, so we stopped sedation, and uh, you see, we extubated the patient, and at extubation, we started to have repeated episodes. And this is the 24 hours data presented in a row. So this occurred despite uh, continuous infusion of beta blockers and calcium channels blockers. By observing the behavior of these three days, we took the decision and the decision was also based, based in the 24 hours analysis of the blood pressure behavior. I draw a line which is dotted in blue at the level of 85 millimeters of mercury. And you see that in phase with those tachycardia episodes, there were significant hemodynamic uh, depression. I mean, the patient went below 85 of uh, systolic uh, arterial pressure, which led in the end to consider ablation of left accessory path pathway. And uh, that is not something you do very easily in a patient in ICU unless you believe there is no chance. We were able to consider this opportunity because we reanalyzed the previous day's data. And uh, one day after, the problem was completely solved and the patient was stable without uh, episodes of paroxysmal tachycardia and uh, with a stable hemodynamic. There is another interesting opportunity. This is not a case report, but please look at this. One of the information you can receive is having a corrected QT duration, uh, and you can have the maximum, the minimum, and the mean value. Why I think we should consider this as an important tool for our medical decision? You know that we use several drugs in our patients, and uh, most of the drugs uh, have a risk of QT prolongation. But in particular, we have a lot of risk of drug-to-drug -drug interaction driving to QT prolongation. QT prolongation is risky <laughs> because it increases the probability of having uh, arrhythmias in our patients. And uh, in this study published one year ago by Becker and co-workers in the Journal of Critical Care, the authors found that the strategy to prevent this risk was related to three 
through the combination of three different aspects, clinical monitoring, bre uh, breath by breath, bit by bit, I mean, immediate monitoring, avoiding combination of drugs, which is not always possible, and uh, the uh, EKG monitoring. Now, I believe that the information that we receive over a longer period of time, for instance, as soon as we interrupt a drug infusion, we don't observe maybe the change immediately, but it's important to see what happens in a longer period of time. Last episode. I like this because of a fancy picture I will show you. Uh, this is a female, 35 years old. She received emergency surgery for hemorrhagic shock. The source was a splenic abscess with a splenic artery erosion, <coughs> left thoracic empyema with disruption of almost all the lower left lobe. The surgeons at the end of the procedure decided that the risk of postoperative fistula was too high to remove the lobe, and at the time of, of the end of surgery, the leak was minimal and not really relevant from a clinical point of view. But few hours after ICU admission, the patient developed ARDS. And uh, as you can see, over a period of about three hours, we observed an increase in the leak, leading to a major problem of hypoventilation. <laughs> so in this condition, we had two chances. Well, at least in my opinion, I might be wrong. One, put the patient in uh, extracorporeal CO2 removal, we were able to maintain oxygenation, or and we decided to follow the indication in, uh, in these uh, uh, images in, in uh, anesthesiology uh, where the author put a blocker of the bronchus to eliminate the source of the leak. Now, <clears throat> this is actually what we did. This is the patient. This is the x-ray. We put the bronchoscopic, locally, of course, the blocker, and we were able to isolate completely the left lower lobe. Now, in the upper part, you see with the color, the red part is what I showed you before, when the leak was huge. Then, in blue, the point in which we, we positioned the beta blocker. The green areas are those where the <laughs> leaks were controlled. And actually, we had to reposition three times the blocker because of uh, uh, during movement of the patient, we lost full control of the condition. However, we observed that in the 24 hours immediately after the intervention, we were able to have a reasonable leak, and we accepted to treat the patient without uh, invading him with the echo to removal technique. Last but not least, the possibility to use additional forms of monitoring. This is an old type of signal uh, which is called perfusion, uh, <laughs> peripheral perfusion index, based on the ratio between arterial pulsatile and non-pulsatile uh, vessels. And this was shown 20 years ago to be an interesting uh, option for the clinician. However, only a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I was able to find a study which suggests a potential role because in defining the risk of prolonged ICU stay, it was even faster than the measurement of lactate. 
uh, in uh, recognizing patients at increased risk of, uh, um, of a prolonged ICU stay, not only uh, the perfusion index was able to predict an increase in the behavioral, I'm sorry, I missed an H in this uh, slide, uh, pain scale of uh, three points. Now, this is our patient, my last uh, uh, clinical case. He arrived from the OR, he was cold and, and he required the liquids. And he was extubated after he was warmed and uh, and filled with uh, saline. And you see that uh, over the following hours, the patient did pretty well. He was uh, stable until 8 o'clock. And we see that the perfusion, peripheral perfusion index drops, <coughs> and the arterial blood goes up, and the heart rate goes up because of nursing. And again, this suggests that you might be able to detect periods where something happens. And sometimes it is useful to revise later on what you did to learn from your wrong behaviors. Last, my personal opinion <coughs> regarding monitoring the future is related to the use of artificial intelligence, not to consider one specific uh, physiologic uh, type of data, but to merge together demographic, laboratory, and dynamic uh, monitoring data to define some index which is able to consider, to alert about the risk of the patient to deteriorate or the risk of a patient of not being stable in the next day or two. This is an example, the artificial intelligence sepsis expert, which is based on collection and integration of all these data on a large number of data crunched by big computer, big devices. And as you can see from the tracing of this patient, the ASA score was much more uh, early in detecting a problem related to sepsy in a patient, and it was much earlier than the SOFA score and 12 hours earlier than the clinical suspicion, which in my opinion, indicate that this is something that will lead our clinical behavior in the future. And I wish to thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Dr. Nabilisi. Um, I'm afraid, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that we're um, out of time pretty much for, for questions. I'd like to just conclude and say that I hope all of you are as excited as me about a new, uh, new paradigm in monitoring. Um, after years of sort of stagnation, just listening to the heart rate alarm go off, we're really on the tipping point of seeing smart alarms and um, smart data from integrated from multiple devices in our ICU, um, alarms that will be much friendlier to our patients and our staff. So I'd like to thank Mindray um, for organizing this um, symposium. I'd like to thank our speakers for giving such excellent talks. And I'd like to thank you all for being here um, throughout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.